I'm going to lay out over the next few minutes a theory of comedy as the marriage, the intersection of lack and excess. So comedy, I want to argue, reveals the structure of subjectivity, which is inherently lacking, and this lack gives rise to excessive attachments. So subjectivity, the structure of it, is this intersection or marriage of lack and excess. As desiring beings, we're inherently lacking. That is, our desire is always focused elsewhere. It's There's an inherent working for, looking for, seeking for something else that's in the nature of subjectivity. And this lack is the way in which subjectivity satisfies itself. So satisfaction doesn't come from obtaining an object. Instead, it comes from this repeating of the experience of lack. And lack is its inability to be filled is what actually defines subjectivity. So subjectivity is being lacking. And as a result of this, excessive attachments occur to what we're lacking. So if we could just obtain an object, we wouldn't attach ourselves to it excessively. We'd just obtain it and that would be it. But because we cannot ever really obtain an object, that is the object that motivates our desire, we can't obtain it, we then excessively attach ourselves to it. And this manifests itself in things like overconsumption. So any kind of addiction or overdoing something is an excessive attachment that is a result of our lacking. So we become addicted to, say, overeating because we're seeking something that we can never obtain within what we eat. And then the result is that we develop this excessive comportment, this excessive behavior. And it, what the, the problem is that the excess does not eliminate the lack. The more excessive we become, the more lacking we feel. And I think anyone who's ever had just an obsession, not to say an addiction, with something will recognize this, that the more you excessively pursue the thing that you're lacking, the more that you feel the lack of it. Now, Typically, I think what's interesting is that we try to keep our lacking aspect of our subjectivity and what's excessive about us apart. And just the, in the most simple way we can think of this, there's the work week. When we're at work, we don't act excessively. Then we come to the weekend, we do things excessively. We drink to excess. We spend the weekend on the couch watching football games we go to orgies, we do whatever, we overeat, especially on holidays. These are, these are times outside of the work week and the lack associated with that. So this separation of lack and excess is the way in which society is, is constituted. And you might call this everyday life. So everyday life is constituted through this separation of lack and excess, which is why you don't go to school drunk or you don't go to work drunk because you're bringing that excess into the realm of lack. And this crossing of the streams is what you're not allowed to do within everyday life. And I think what's interesting is it's equally forbidden to be obviously displaying lack at a party when everyone else is acting excessively. So you can't bring lack to the excess and you can't bring excess into the realm of lack. That's what makes everyday life what it is. Now, I think comedy is a really interesting exception to this because comedy occurs, I'm arguing, when we confront lack and excess coming together in a way that takes us by surprise. So I think the element of surprise is crucial. The comic moment has to always be a surprise and show us this intersection of lack and excess in a way that we didn't see coming. 
And thus we recognize the very nature of our subjectivity in this comic moment. And any time lack and excess coinciding takes us by surprise, we experience comedy. And the result is that we laugh. So the, the intersection of lack and excess is what produces the comic moment. And this comic moment is revelatory about the very nature of subjectivity, which is this intersection of lack and excess. And I think this is what occurs every time we laugh at a joke. Let's look at one. So Jesus and Moses are golfing in heaven. And they come up to a really difficult golf hole. This is a par three going out over the water. You see heaven has a very nice golf course. And Jesus says to Moses, you know, Tiger Woods would hit an eight iron on this hole, which is a club that doesn't necessarily make it go far, but because Tiger Woods is such a good player, he can hit it far. And Moses says, look, you're not that good. You can't use a club like that. You got to use a club that'll go longer or else you're going to hit in the water. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. Tiger Woods would do it. I can do it. So he hits his ball out and lo and behold, it goes right in the water. But because Jesus is Jesus, he walks out in the water, picks up his golf ball, comes back to the hole. Again, Moses says, now use, use, a, use a club that you can get it there with. Use a five iron, for instance. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Tiger Woods would hit an eight iron. I'm hitting an eight iron. Hits it again. Again, plops right in the water right before the hole. Again, Jesus walks out to get the ball. And as he's walking out, another group comes up behind and says to Moses, who's that guy out there in the water think he is? Jesus Christ? And Moses says, no, he thinks he's Tiger Woods. So that joke works, I think, because it brings together Jesus as a figure of lack and a figure of excess. So he's lacking as a golfer. He's not Tiger Woods, but he's excessive. He's Jesus Christ. He can walk on water. So we get this bringing together. And when he's walking out in the water and the other golfers say, who does he think he is? Jesus Christ. We get the at that precise moment, this intersection of lack and excess, that he's Christ, not Tiger Woods. Christ is excessive, not Tiger Woods as lacking. So the pun, I think, follows the same logic as this joke. And the pun, I want to argue, is actually the primal form of comedy. You can trace every comic moment back to the structure of the pun. And a pun always plays on an excess in signification. And what's fascinating to me about the pun is that it corresponds to the lack of a specific signification. So words mean multiple things because they don't just mean one thing. So that's the, that's the link between excess and lack in the pun. So they lack a clear signification, we could say, because they signify excessively. For instance, I tried to read Hegel, but found out that I can't. Or you could pronounce it this way. I tried to read Hegel, but found out that I can't. Okay, so here we get the pun on can't and can't. And that nicely shows the way in which can't or can't has a double, the homonym has a double signification. Or even more basic, the whiteboard is remarkable. So what's it's not so funny, but what's nice about this pun is that it plays on the word, the double signification of remarkable. So it can be marked again, and it's remarkable, it stands out, it's excellent. Okay, so this is how the pun brings together excess, excess, excess of signification, and lack, lack of a, sign, a single signification. Let's look at the film Groundhog Day. So Groundhog Day, I think, is one of the great comedies ever made. I think there's an argument that it's the greatest film comedy ever made. And one thing that it does is it shows Phil Connors, the Bill Murray character, as lacking because he's stuck repeating the same day. But what's funny about the film is he constantly responds excessively to this state of lack. And his excessive responses are what makes the humor of the film. I 
like to see a man of advancing years throwing caution to the wind. It's inspiring in a way. My years are not advancing as fast as you might think. More coffee, hon? Yeah, just keep it coming, please. Sure thing. It's real nice. Just put that anywhere, pal. Yeah. <laughs> Good save. <laughs> Don't you worry about cholesterol, lung cancer, love handles? I don't worry about anything anymore. What makes you so special? Everybody worries about something. Well, that's exactly what makes me so special. I don't even have to floss. Oh. What? So, Phil has an incredibly lacking situation, and it's 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 traumatic for him. He's stuck in the same day living out this horrible life again and again and again in the town of Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. But the way that he excessively responds to it, as in this situation of the diner where he eats the, takes the, the tart and all in his mouth at one time, this is the source of comedy in the film. And, and at one time even excessively tries to kill himself through all these different means. And, and, and that's funny. And, and what's interesting about the humor is that every time he's excessive, it's funny in the film. We can also think about Jewish jokes in this light, I think, because they often bring together the very clearly lacking situation of Jews in the world for quite a while, along with the status that Jews have as God's chosen people. So here's my favorite Jewish joke. Man comes to a rabbi and says, Rabbi, I don't know what to do. I gave my son a good bar mitzvah. I gave him a, a good Jewish education. I took him to the synagogue all the time. And he grew up and became Christian. And the rabbi goes, wow, I know just how you feel. That's what happened to my son. And the man says to the rabbi, well, what should I do? And the rabbi goes, I tell you what, why don't I go ask God? And he goes to God, he says, God, what do I do? I gave my son a great Jewish education. I gave him a nice bar mitzvah. I took him to the synagogue every week. And he grew up and became Christian. God says to the rabbi, I know just how you feel. <laughs> so what's interesting about this joke is that it shows the way in which God is lacking. And I think that's one of the things, because God can't control his own son. And I think God is, of course, a figure of excess, but God is also a figure of lack. And that's one of the things that's evident in most Jewish jokes. So like the famous joke, the Jewish people are chosen, but chosen for what? Right. So th this notion that they are excessive, they're chosen, but chosen for what? That they're always there's always a lack attached to that. And that same relation, lack, excess, is evident even in the Jewish God. And I think this is one of the things that we can see in Charlie Chaplin as well. Like Phil Connors in Groundhog Day, Chaplin in all of his films is in a position of lack, but he responds always with excess. I think this is clearest in the film Modern Times. <laughs> In this scene, we see Chaplin as a figure of lack relative to the automated production, but his response to his lack is to excessively turn the screws constantly and to even follow him doing his job into the machine itself. So he, this excessive response is funny 
because it shows how it, it emphasizes how he's lacking. So he, his excess doesn't eliminate his lack. It makes it all the more evident, thus the humor here. I think what's interesting is Chaplin's little tramp character responds to being a social exile with the excessive dress of the wealthy, whereas a tie, the bowler, the cane, the suit coat. So he he attempts to look and dress and attire himself excessively in response to his position as lack. And I think this is a really important thing that Chaplin is doing. So he's not showing this social outcast, this homeless person as a someone to be pitied. Instead, he's showing this person as someone who can be a source of comedy. But it's not a comedy that denigrates him. That instead, Chaplin shows that laughing at him actually is a kind of political awakening. So seeing this figure of homelessness as potentially comic is one of the ways in which Chaplin's films work politically. Now, comedy has the ability to undermine an authority figure, not just show us the contradiction within a figure of social exile, but it can undermine an authority figure by showing how the excess of authority itself is tied to a lacking subject. And we can see this when we hear George Bush talk about terrorism. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. So it's great that Bush really did think about ways to harm our country and our people. He didn't mean to say that, but what's interesting is Bush's own statements constantly reveal himself and authority as lacking. And I think comedy is emancipatory when it shows us that everyone is lacking, that everyone has this intersection of lack and excess, and that no one is whole. But conservative comedy tries to have someone remain whole and immune from contradiction, immune from this relationship between lack and excess. And we can see this in the case of a different, this time George Bush trying to tell a joke, not stumbling into a joke, when he at the correspondence dinner joked about searching for weapons of mass destruction, the weapons that were the justification for the Iraq war, but were never found. So what's interesting is that joke made him as the teller in a secure position as a substantial authority. It did not undermine his authority at all. It did not show him lacking. So the emancipatory joke, on the other hand, has to reveal that everyone is both lacking and excessive. And the joke doesn't have to be even overtly political to be emancipatory because what it can be doing is undermining our everyday perceptions, as we see in one of my favorite little scenes from any film, a little clip from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles with John Candy and Steve Martin. Oh, oh. great, great. Cop, watch it! How fast are you going? I can't tell, the speedometer's milk. Pull over. Top of the morning, officer. Hi. Is there something I can help you with? What the hell are you driving here? We had a small fire last night, but we caught it in the nick of time. <laughs> you have any idea how fast you were going? Well, funnily enough, I was just talking to my friend about that. Our speedometer's melted, and as a result, it's very hard to say with any degree of accuracy exactly uh, how fast we were going. 78 miles an hour. 78, huh? Well, yeah, I could buy that, sure, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, you would know better than us, uh, especially since we got a melted speedometer. Do you feel this vehicle is safe for highway travel? Yes, I do. Yes, I really do. I, I, I believe that. I know it's not pretty to look at, but it'll get you where you want to go. Now, you got no outside mirror. No, we lost that. You have no functioning gauges. No, not a one. However, the radio still works. Funny <laughs> as that may seem, with all this mess, that the radio is the only thing that's really working good, and it's as clear as a bell. Don't ask me how. <laughs> so what's great about this scene, I think, is that rather than admit that his vehicle is lacking, that it's in bad shape, instead... 
the figure of Dell launches into excessive praise of it, especially how great the radio is, how the, the car will get you where you want to go, even though it's not much to look at. And so all these statements are incredibly funny, I think, precisely because they show this relationship between excess and lack. Now, as I said, everyday life continues to go by as it does through this segregation of lack and excess, which comedy interrupts. And it interrupts everyday life by showing this mutual interdependence of lack and excess and how excess produces lack and how lack produces excess. What I think is so radical about comedy is that it forces us to see that our most excessive enjoyment is inextricably linked to a traumatic lack so that we cannot separate enjoyment from lack, enjoyment from suffering. And this, I think, is an insight that comedy really is alone in providing for us. Let's conclude with an interesting joke that makes this point about the political, philosophical, speculative nature of comedy. So two guys are out for a walk and they see about 100 feet down the road, down the path that they're on, a grizzly bear. And one guy kneels down, takes out his backpack and starts to change shoes, putting on his running shoes. And the other guy says to him, you're not going to outrun a grizzly bear. And the guy putting on the shoes says, I don't have to outrun the grizzly bear. <laughs> now, what's great about this joke, I think, is that it shows the traumatic nature of our enjoyment. So our, our laughing at the joke depends on somebody being eaten by the grizzly bear. And this trauma is necessary. Obviously, we don't need somebody being eaten, but there has to be some painful loss attached to our subjectivity for enjoyment to be possible. And I think that's what this joke and all jokes really make clear. This joke may be more than any other. So whenever we think of the, the relationship between lack and enjoyment, I think it's good to think of the figure of the grizzly bear. Mm -hmm.